we're learning the Bible is in its most essential nature one divine book. Um, that is, it's a it's a unified story from God with an overriding storyline, a developing plot that runs through the whole thing from start to finish. From the opening in the beginning in Genesis 1-1 to the closing Amen of Revelation 22-21. From paradise and paradise lost to paradise regained at last. From the way to the tree of life closed and guarded after the fall to the right of access to the tree of life restored and opened at the end. So when we think about, sometimes you'll hear me say putting our Bibles together, what we're talking about when we say putting the Bible together properly, we're just talking about learning to see how God has composed the whole thing along this plot line um, of creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. Those are kind of the four major points in the plot line. Um, and that's unfolded progressively. We'll see this as we go. It's unfolded progressively through the, uh, a revealing series of covenants. Um, and, and what we're looking to see is how God has woven together a revelation of himself and his great work of redemption in history that is, at one and the same time, it is elegantly elementary, and yet it is powerfully profound. It is diverse in its literary expression. There will be history, there will be poetry, there will be song, there will be letters, gospels, which are kind of their own unique literary genre. So <clears throat> literarily, it's very diverse in its expression, and yet it is unified in its divine message. And uh, it's within reach of the most unstudied, simple-hearted soul, and yet continues to make foolish the wisdom of the world. So uh, that, that should become clearer and clearer to us as we go. So the goal in this particular series of studies, it's technically called biblical theology, um, the goal is to highlight the great themes that are spread across whole books and whole sections and, and the whole of the Bible and that weave through the whole and tie it all together so that we get the whole picture of God's revelation to us in his word. You know, in our, our weekly Institute Bible study series we're doing this time is a verse-by-verse -verse, um, examination of one part of Scripture, the text of Paul's letter to the Philippians, and the goal there is to examine closely and very carefully all the pieces that make, uh, make up uh, the book to make sure we understand each piece properly and how the pieces fit together to arrive at the meaning in the text. How many Bible studies have you been in where they read a text and the first thing they say is, what does that mean to you? Well, that's the wrong question. You can't get to that. That's an application question. You can't get to that question until you first arrive as, what, what does this mean? What is the truth here? And once you've arrived at that, then you can talk about how it applies to you. But, boy, I've been in some where it was like, Paul says he's in chains here. What does that mean to you? And somebody over here says, well, I was a chain smoker one time. And, and then somebody else is like, well, I had some snow chains on my tires, and they did. Just kind of take a word and run off with it. it. has nothing to do with the text at all. So what we're doing in that study is looking at the pieces, understanding them properly, seeing how they fit to give us the meaning of, of, um, of the text. That, that's important work to do. But what we have to guard against as you do that kind of work is... We have to guard against atomizing the text. 
you know, just reducing it to its smallest pieces and trying to draw some lesson from the pieces that's not connected to the larger themes of the whole Bible, themes that govern what any part or any piece of Scripture can actually mean. It'd be like... um, It would be like inspecting one piece of a large jigsaw puzzle and then announcing what that one piece, its color and its size and its shape, what that means to me. Well, you know, that kind of observation may be interesting. It's more than likely to be puzzling and confusing and peculiar and almost certainly irrelevant to what the whole picture is. And... um, because it's purely subjective. It's detached from the whole picture of the puzzle that gives that piece its place and its significance. So um, these go together. The pieces properly understood complete the picture. The picture gives larger significance. It gives place and purpose to all the pieces. So here's your, uh, here's your commercial for next year again in our institute next year, 2023-24. It'll it'll be about this, examining the interplay of these disciplines and properly interpreting and applying the Bible to real life. Now, does all of this require commitment and effort on our parts? Yeah, and that's why I'm so... Delighted week after week to see you up early and <laughs> here to, uh, to apply yourself to this kind of thing, to think these things through. Um, that's why we're exhorted. You're exhorted. I'm exhorted to do your best to make every effort to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed rightly handling the word of truth or teaching the message of truth accurately. Now, what does that imply? That there are wrong ways to handle the word and that you can handle it inaccurately. And so this is why we're called to apply ourselves to just this kind of thing. You know, we started several weeks ago with the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2. That's what's called in the development of a good plot. That's called the exposition. Uh, This is where the stage is set. You meet several key characters, and you first start to grasp the setting for Scripture's story. And then we moved a couple of weeks ago into Genesis 3 in the fall. That's called the complication in the plot line. And uh, what a complication it is. We learn there... What has gone wrong? How did God's very good creation become what we know and experience now in our own lives? How did things become bad? What went wrong? And once we begin to grasp that, that establishes the terrible dilemma that the rest of Scripture then goes on to address. How can sinful, rebellious human beings ever be acceptable before the triune, holy God, given sin's impurity, given sin's pollution. How can you and I ever stand before God without being condemned? That's the question from Genesis 3 on. So last week we looked at just that seed of promise in Genesis 3, the one verse, Genesis 3. 315, sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, the hope that God has given us from the start in and through what he alone has promised to do by one who will come um, uh, as the offspring of the woman. And now this morning we move into Genesis chapters 4 through 11, eight chapters. And we called it, if you, if you looked at the study guide, we called this part of it last week was promise. Uh, this, this part we call regression to revolution. Sounds very ominous. But it bears out 
in this text, in, in real lives, in history, it bears out the desperate depths and the crushing consequences of our fallen depravity, even as it showcases the, um, the relentless determination of our covenant God's gracious purposes. In other words, the beauty of God's glorious grace stands out all the more against the backdrop of this regression and revolution. Remember, the essence of the kingdom of God from the beginning, the essence of the kingdom of God is the reign of God over the people of God in God's place for their good and for his glory. That is, from the start, the intrinsic nature of the kingdom of God. N never think of the creation account as just some sort of, you know, biblical fairy tale that's only meant to explain where everything came from. It does that, but it explains so much more as well. For example, it teaches us that the only perfect existence for the creature is that found within the framework of the rule of God, which is precisely what sin rebels against, the framework of the rule of God. And then thinks somehow that it's going to find perfection outside the rule of God, outside the garden, outside of God's safe place. And at the core of this, we might note this as we pass, at the core of this is the sheer irrationality of sin. That's what Paul's unpacking, for example, in Romans 1, when he writes that in the face of the unavoidable knowledge of God, the wicked are without excuse because although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. But what happened to them? They became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened in claiming to be wise, they became fools. It's sheer irrationality. They think they're intelligent. They think they're sophisticated. These new atheists call themselves the brights. <laughs> just great. But they're, they're just not being honest with the data. Instead of using their minds to recognize and then pursue the truth, they use them to rationalize and justify their sin and rebellion. It's, it's the saddest thing to see people do. They reject the knowledge of the true God, and so in doing so, they reject true knowledge of themselves. And then they make all sorts of exalted claims to great wisdom. This is, a, this is, this is the kind of thing that's at work in, in all of these cases of um, celebrity Christians, I mean, we know these things because they end up in the news and they end up on our Facebook feed and this kind of stuff, but this is what's at work in the cases of these folks you, you may read about who are deconstructing their faith. That's, that's the thing now. They're finding themselves, and this is all the kind of language that they use. They turn away from God. They talk a lot about bright new ideas. They talk about seeing the light, the aufklärung. They, they talk about uh, the, uh, the clearing up, the enlightenment that they've come to. But it's all an illusion. It's all the, the delusion of the sinful self. Professing to be wise, they become fools, and their foolishness is nowhere more clearly seen than in their determined substitution of their own way for that of God. I mean, these are big themes that are picked up from these early chapters in Genesis. And these chapters make one thing painfully, terribly clear. 
outside the garden is the place of death. Rational death, spiritual death, finally physical death. And once outside, there is no return to innocence. Redemption becomes our only hope. No going back. Our only hope at that point is redemption. God must do something or we are undone. See, it's intentional, for example, that the tree of life, which is, which is denied to fallen humanity in the garden, shows up again in the description of the new Jerusalem over in Revelation 22. Why? Because true life is bound up with the kingdom of God. God God's rule over God's people in God's place for their good, for their glory. It's the only place life is found outside the kingdom, there's only death. The, the concept of the, this concept of the kingdom dominates the biblical storyline from beginning to end, and sin in every case is, is basically the attempt to dethrone the true king and set ourselves up in his place. That's what sin is in its essence in a kingdom of our own little making. And that's why this, it's why every attempt to live apart from God, apart from his presence, apart from his rule, that's why it comes under the wrath of God over and over and over. You'll see this in the storyline of scriptures. You know, a, a sinful life is not necessarily a scandalous life. I need to say that again. Think about this. A sinful life is not necessarily a scandalous life. Without any overt, visible act of wickedness at all, you can sin profoundly in your heart, and in your thought. Without committing any wicked act at all, you can sin profoundly simply in omitting those things you ought to have done. In the middle of an admirable, conscientious, useful life, you can still be Godless. That is, without God in your thoughts, without God in your plans, without any consideration of what God has said, what He what he desires, what he wants from us. See, what lies at the heart of sin is simply the desire and the attempt to live apart from God, to live for self without any reference to God, self-sufficiently, independently of God. It's, the, it, it's just the practical assertion, we will not have this one rule over us. All these are some of the, the massive themes that are being introduced in the early chapters of Genesis, and they're crucial to reading uh, the rest of the Bible on its own terms. So by the time we get to these chapters, 4 through 11, uh, a, a dominant theme already in place is this, the power and pervasiveness of sin. The, the penetrating presence and the prominence of human rebellion against the Creator Lord. It may have begun in the garden, but it then pours over outside the garden. It's found, as we'll see, not only before the flood, it's found after the flood too. And we begin early here in the story to get some sense of the enormity of sin, which can be measured only in light of the true glory and reality of who God is. I have to say, and this is after spending nearly my whole life in churches, 
in almost 30 years as a senior pastor and now uh, more, going on 19 years as a university professor in religion and philosophy, I have to say that the church at large in America has failed monumentally on two foundational counts, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of sin. Both have been tragically sterilized, just, just trivialized with monumentally disastrous results. Both God and sin seem now to be, for all practical purposes, weightless in the life of the church. This is a, this is a thesis that David Wells unpacks at some length in a couple of really good books that are hard books you have to they're slow to read books but uh, man one is the first one he wrote is called no place for truth or whatever happened to evangelical theology and then the second one was titled god in the wasteland the reality of truth in a world of fading dreams and he just sort of analyzes this whole business of losing the weightiness of God, especially in the life of the church. We just don't sense any awe in the presence of God. Theology, well, says, is disappearing, but not, he says, not as if someone has simply abducted it. No, he says the disappearance is closer to what happens in homes where the children are ignored and to all intents and purposes, abandoned. They remain in the home, but they have no place in the family. So it is with theology in the church. It remains on the edges of evangelical life, but it has been dislodged from the center. That is, in other words, core doctrines of the faith, especially the doctrine of God, the doctrine of sin, now no longer define or shape what it means to be Christian or what it means to be a, a, a church. And if you're wondering, that is bad news for us. Just know, we can do this. We can abandon theology. We can, we can set aside any concerns about doctrinal accuracy and precision, depth and, and meaning. We can ride the train down the road of professionalism and marketing savvy and event management. We can do that kind of stuff. Plenty of churches are doing that. We can put most of the emphasis on Josh being the manager of the corporation. You know, just the agent of growth, the counselor of the codependent, the motivator of volunteers. Then we put on his biblical and theological preparation to lead people to know the true God and to shun every false ideology that comes at them. We, we can respond to you know, felt needs and give people what they say they want rather than respond with the truth and give them what they really need. We can do all that kind of stuff. But that house will finally come down and great will be the fall of it. For example, I mean, from the start here, God, God gives us these great doctrinal themes these, these foundational truths that run through all of Scripture that help us come to grips with the things that really matter, that shines a light in all of our darkness and points away in all the confusion and teaches us wisdom and understanding here while we live in Vanity Fair and gives us direction and bearing and hope in the howling wilderness that is our time you know it's commonplace now in our culture for example to speak of sin simply as 
missing the mark, right? You hear this all the time. And it's true. Sin is that. It, it is a falling short of the norm, of the goal. The question is, biblically, is that all sin is? Most folks readily admit that they're, they, that they're missing the mark, that they're not all they could be. <laughs> that's, that's easy to admit. They'll do it down at the Waffle House all the time when I talk to people. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll readily say, well, I'm not doing all I might and so on. In that sense, they will, in that sense, they'll admit that they are sinners. And yet that admission often has little or nothing to do biblically with what it means to be a sinner and to be convicted of sin, to know you are a sinner and to confess before the living and holy God that reality. The whole idea of sin has been minimized. It's been sterilized. It's been trivialized. There, now, it's just a, just a problem. It's just a mistake. It's just, a, um, you know, not living up to my potential and, and those kinds of things. But there are other words biblically that significantly enlarge the concept of sin. And those are ideas we'll see through Scripture such as twisting and distortion and revolt and transgression. Don't miss this. Sin is missing the mark, but it's not a good-intentioned, well-meant, honest, sincere miss. It's a perverted, rebellious miss. It's not a miss in the right direction. It's a miss in the opposite direction. And these chapters here, Genesis 4 through 11, early on in the story, present to us this persistent tendency toward revolution against God's rule. What was conceived in lust in the garden, developed into sin and guilt, it grew up as corruption, as corruption, and finally it matured into a full-scale revolution against the Creator Lord in uh, Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. See, Adam and Eve learned some hard, hard lessons, principle among them being that sin cannot deliver on what it promises. This is another theme. <laughs> sin cannot deliver on what it promises. In fact, it never intended to. Adam and Eve didn't find paradise. They found they'd lost paradise. I mean, it's highly significant that we read in chapter 3, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. And they couldn't even cope with the knowledge of each other and what they'd done, much less cope with the mysteries of good and evil. They weren't empowered by this. They were diminished. Sin does not mature and develop you. It wounds and weakens you. It does not clothe and honor you. It leaves you naked and ashamed. It does not make you more. It makes you less always in every way. These are all themes, the seeds of which are planted right here in these early chapters and then these arcs, these trajectories of these themes run all through the storyline. And now comes this account of these two sons. Genesis 4 opens with the birth of a son, Cain, and a second son, Abel. And the question at that point in the storyline is, well, might one of these be the one? Eve's, Adam's, they're, they're expecting the one to come that was promised. Might these be, one of these be the one, the serpent killer? Other than their vocations, the first thing, we learn about them deals with the matter of worship. They each come before the Lord 
with an offering, and we, and, and, and we read, the Lord had regard for, he was pleased with Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. He was not pleased. In other words, there was acceptable and there was unacceptable worship. So th there's another theme that we can, we can trace out through Scripture. God is the one who designates what's acceptable worship, right? That means we, we don't get to make any of this up as we go. There is such a thing as deviant worship that God will not accept. That's, John, that's probably a whole course on biblical worship right there, if you want to start thinking about planning that. See, Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice. He brought a, in the, in the text here, a blood sacrifice. A death that reminded the worshiper of the wages of sin, pointed the way that God himself would save his people for himself at last. But Cain, Cain brought some produce. Stuff he'd grown. And... Uh, the point is not that, uh, guys, it's not that oh, we've got to have meat all the time, no vegetable. Not the point of the text. The point is Cain, Cain simply, apparently God had established what acceptable worship was, and Cain simply didn't want to be told what to do or how to worship. He wasn't interested in God's way. He's only interested in and this is a phrase that comes up later in Scripture. He's only interested in the way of Cain. He's only interested in Cain's way. And the theme is the same as it was with Eve and Adam, isn't it? He ignores what God has said. He does what he wants in line with his own desires and his own feelings. And what happens when God rejects that? Well, he, Cain gets mad. His whole character of heart is revealed in his response to God's rejection of his self-styled worship. He gets sulky, he gets pouty, he gets ill-tempered, you know. Rather than repent and do right, sin completely dominates him and he ends up murdering his righteous brother out of envy and hate. He's, he's self-absorbed, he's dominated by self-will, he's insubordinate, he's irreverent, he wants what he wants, and nobody, including God, is going to tell him what to do. And when the Lord asks him where Abel is, again, not for geographic information, it's like when he called Adam in the garden, where are you? He's calling him to account. When he asks him where his brother is, here is. He's not asking geographic information. The blood of Abel is crying out from the ground. He's calling the sinner to account. And what does God and what does Cain say? Where is your brother Abel? I don't know. Not my brother's keeper. Just like his father Adam. He tries to evade the question. He tries to evade responsibility for his sin. So here we are now. We've got just a little bit on these two sons, and it's, it's obvious that neither of these sons can reverse the curse and restore rest for God's people. One is dead by this point, and the other clearly belongs to the offspring of the serpent. So things immediately don't get better. They get worse. Sin's been passed on to the next generation. And, and with it, all the alienation with others and with God. And at the heart of the story about Cain and his descendants here is the whole attempt to leave the presence of God and live life without God. It's instructive that we're told at the end of this count that Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. 
and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He went away from the presence of the Lord. That's the whole, that's the whole point here. This is, this is sin's goal, to leave the presence of God and live life without God. And, and, and we might note, as you read this account here, Cain, this theme of rebellion against God, it's not just leave God, but just rebellion against God continues in the fact that Cain, upon whom God's curse included that he would be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, he would never find a place of permanent settlement, what's the first thing he tries to do? Build a city. Build a place of permanent residence. Build a place of safety is the first thing he tries to do. It's just in seed form again, what we'll find when we get to the account of the Tower of Babel. I'm not going to act on what you say. I'm not going to believe your word. I'm going to do what I want to do. You've cursed me and said, I'll be a wanderer, but I'm going to build a city and a safe place for myself. Will things get any better? I mean, you get through Cain and Abel here, and you're like, things are looking bad. This looks like regression and revolution. Well, next in the story is this cat named Lamech. And the very first, the very first thing we read of him is that he took two wives. Now, why would we be told that? What's significant about that? Well, it's a further flying in the face of God. God created one man, one woman, united them in monogamous marriage, and here's Lamech saying, I, I'm not going to settle for that. I'm going to do something else. I'm leaving what God has said and what he's outlined the rule of his kingdom, and I'm going to do my own thing. So his case, right off the bat, you see his case is not progress. It's regress. His case is not development, but deformity of what God has established. His case is not reverence, but it's revolt too. You see? And then there's this song of his that, uh, that he has been called his sword song. There's, there's mention of some of his sons, and then one of his sons is a guy named Tubal Cain, who was, we read, the forger of all instruments or tools of bronze or iron, or more literally, hammering all kinds of cutting things in brass and iron. This is who his son was. He was the inventor of edge tools in metal. And see, Lamech, he sees that, and he's sensing and celebrating the possibilities that lie in possessing such instruments. You can almost see him standing there, maybe waving one of these sword-like instruments over his head. And, I mean, while on one level it's just that, it's a salute to the sword, more deeply, this is a glorification of the spirit of personal revenge. Lamech's song is that. It reflects the spirit of those who've grown estranged from God and his word. Lamech's saying basically, if anybody hurts me, there will be payback with extreme prejudice. And the climax of his song is, God may see to it that anyone who harms Cain gets a sevenfold recompense. But you know what? I'm going to take the whole matter into my own hands. I'm going to mete out by the strength of my own hand and by the weapons of my son's production here. I'm going to mete out a far more severe punishment than God would. Not sevenfold, but seventy-sevenfold. H.C. Leupold, who's an old commentator on the book of Genesis, he said in his commentary, 
the arrogance and presumption are unbelievable. The spirit of self-sufficiency here, expressing itself over leaps all bounds. This then, coupled with its hate and revengefulness, makes it one of the most ungodly pieces ever written. Such are the achievements of human culture divorced from God. See, here again is regression and revolution. In stunning contrast to that, of course, stands the Lord's own measure of gospel forgiveness. Seventy times seven to be practiced by his people. And ever since Lamech, and we'll see it at the Tower of Babel, the the world has worshipped strength, right? Physical strength, executive strength, mental strength, self-reliant, self-sufficient strength in the world's eyes. That kind of strength is definitive of the good life. But what we'll learn more and more as we go is that a good life comes only when you weaken. And in weakness, find your strength in the Lord. Only when you give up you and you deny self and you offer yourself a living sacrifice, that's when, when life lines up with the good and holy and perfect will of God. That's the good life. But at this point, here's another Here's, here's another person in the, in, the, in the line who's clearly the seed of the serpent, not a deliverer. And now another son of Adam and Eve enters the picture, Seth. And we learn right off that Eve appropriates that offspring promise in Genesis 3.15, and she perceives him to be God's replacement for Abel. She says, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So while Cain's line at this point is the seed and the offspring of the serpent, Seth's line is again the seed or the offspring of the woman. And Seth has a son named Enosh. And uh, then we read instructively, that at that time people began to call on the name of the Lord. So here in the midst of all this regression and all this revolt we've been against God that we've been reading about here, here in the middle of all that, God is still at work. His plan is not foiled. His purpose is not thwarted. Let the culture of Cain do its worst. There is yet another line of seed running through all this, one that so far from revolting against God, calls on and depends on the Lord. So true and regular worship of the Lord is again established in the world. Jim Boyce says the line of Seth had recognized that sin was no mere imperfection of human nature, but something destined to destroy both the individual and culture unless it should be overcome by the grace and power of Almighty God. So these individuals threw themselves on God and trusted Him wholly for their physical and spiritual salvation. So there's... there's Steady regression and revolution, but at every turn, that showcases this relentless determination and miraculous intervention of our covenant God's gracious promises. As David Atkinson says, despite all the ravages of sin, it's spreading through the generations, it's violence, it's vengeance, it's murderous rage, the isolation and alienation and anxiety to which it leads, the disorders and ambiguities of life in this broken world, God still can be known. People begin to call on the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.
that hope is still faced with the reality that uh, we run into in Genesis 5. And this genealogy in Genesis 5 reminding us that even though life goes on, it's overshadowed by this reign of death again and again and again. Each person's life, except for Enoch's, each person's life in this genealogy ends with one haunting Hebrew word. Vayamuk, and he died, 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 and he died eight times in this chapter. As Paul later writes, even before the giving of the law, death reigned. All this, see, now is the setup to Noah's story beginning in Genesis 6. Noah's father, at the end of chapter 5, says, And hopes of Noah out of the ground that the Lord has cursed. This one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And the question at that point is, well, does he? <laughs> is he maybe the one? Well, the God-given assessment of the whole situation, by the time we get to Genesis 6, the God-given assessment is that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Or to, to quote the esteemed theologian John Stark, we were talking before church. You can sum it up like this. You guys are terrible. <laughs> Yikes. As humans multiplied, so did human sin and evil. Regression, revolution is the order of the day. The bad news is really bad. It's worse than we ever expected. For the first time, we get a glimpse of just how deep and universal our dilemma is. So on one level, see, the story of Noah's Ark is not just a fun little story about friendly animals to entertain children. It, this is a horror story. The hideous recounting of our outrageous rebellion against God our Creator and Lord and the monstrous consequences it has worked in our lives and all the world. And God determines, we read here, to wipe humankind from the face of the earth. And says he will do so by a flood. Of course, the severity and the extent of, of the flood corresponds to the severity and the extent of human sin. It's just, it's hard for us to imagine the devastation that's described here. I mean, we know what it's like for it to rain, sometimes for days, and for our creeks and our streams and rivers to flood and wreak havoc. We just saw what hurricane can do in, in, uh, in Florida. The devastation it wreaks there. But what's it like for it to rain torrentially? relentlessly, violently, hour after hour, 24 hours a day, day after day, week after week, for a month and a half. And not only were, we read, the windows in the sense of the sluices, the sliding gates for controlling the floor, flow of water, the, not only were the floodgates of the heavens opened, but also all the fountains of the great deep burst forth too. All the subterranean waters rushing up from below. And this watery deep that we read about here, same word that's used in Genesis 1, verse 2, to describe the primeval state of the earth as without form 
and void. And the significance of that language, see, you're connecting these things. You've read that story, and now you hear this language again. You say, what is this? Well, the significance seems to be, among other things, that in this judgment, God is returning the world to its earlier condition, being covered with water. That is, this judgment involves the reversal of creation. Now picture that. Picture the rising, rushing waters, the ensuing widespread panic. Multitudes of people are drowning, helpless before what Jesus called hakataklusmos, the, the cataclysm. Jesus said in those days they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Everything going on is normal until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood, the kataklutsain, the washing down came and swept them away. See, before we can ever appreciate the story of Noah's ark as something wonderful, we must first see it as the Bible does. This, this, this whole scene is something horrifying and tragic. God says to Noah, I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. Now, do you, you, you catch that crucial word in the middle of what God says here? Everything is slotted for death, but, there's the word, but, Noah will live. The, ju- the, the earth will be judged, but God will establish his covenant with Noah, and that means life for the world. Noah's entire family is invited to join him. Humanity survives and continues along with the animal. Noah obeyed the Lord. He built the ark. The Lord shut him in, his family with him at last. The flood came. Every living thing was killed, and only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. And then, after many more months, actually, the waters subsided. And at God's command, Noah and his family came out of the ark, and what greeted their eyes? Devastation, carnage, human sin was crushed under the weight of an ocean as wide as the earth and as deep as the mountains. And so in the storyline, Noah, a son of Eve, is saved to save the world. That is, here's a chance to start over, to begin again. God makes a covenant with creation through Noah. Noah's pictured in this instance as a new Adam. All this language from Genesis 1 and 2 is picked up again here. And at this point in the story, never had things looked this good for humanity since Eden. But what happens? Even with his father's prophetic hopes about what Noah would do, even with these promises from God, even with the hope of imminent rest, what do we soon learn? That Noah still has Adam's problem. In no time at all, we find Noah drunk and naked in his tent. We don't know why he's drunk. We don't know why he got naked in his tent. But we do know this whole thing is shameful for Noah. And we're reminded again that as faithful as he was, Noah is not the son of Eve who will turn back sin and death. Noah himself needs a redeemer. Noah's world is a new creation. Noah himself is a new Adam. God's covenant with Noah is not a, it's not a covenant that begins with Noah, 
It's a covenant that is extended through Noah. Uh, the covenant originally made with creation through Adam. And it's a reaffirmation that God is still committed to his entire creation. God has not abandoned it. God is going to continue to honor his own plans as we first saw them in Genesis 1 and 2. So what God intended through Adam, he'll fulfill through Adam's race. God promises then not to wipe away the human race and constantly start over again. While the world remains in a fallen, cursed state, God tells Noah that he's, he's hung his rainbow in the sky as a reminder of his promise. From Noah to the end of the age, God will now allow for the simultaneous existence of these two kingdoms, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God, the city of man and the city of of God. Salvation will come in due time. It'll come through God's provision of a godly seed. But with Noah at this point intoxicated, naked in his tent, we, we're left to wonder again in the story how the promise of Genesis 3.15 is going to come. How's this going to come about? Someone greater than Adam and someone greater than Noah must come. So at this point, sin continues, regression and revolution still characterize the human race, and once more, things spiral downwards. This is after the judgment of the flood. Things spiral downwards until we come to this account of the Tower of Babel. People had developed a civilization again without God, and they got this plan. They're remembering the flood. We got wiped out there. Let's build a tower for safety, for security, for, for, for a name for ourselves. That's the vision for the tower. It'll reach to heaven. And the purpose for doing that, they say in the text, is to make a name for themselves, and the motivation is not to be scattered over the face of the earth, to be united in our revolt against the rule of God. As you read this account in Genesis, Genesis um, 9, 10, 11, really, just notice all the repetition of let us. Let us do this and let us do that and let us do this other thing. And it all points out dramatically and intentionally the careful planning of fallen humanity, not only to interfere with God's plan, but to really take for themselves God's authority on earth and in heaven. The Tower of Babel in the storyline is the symbol of man's revolutionary spirit against God, who is the true creator and ruler and sustainer. So this, this Tower of Babel was a strategy conceived and built by sinful humanity to establish their own security so that we may not be scattered, they said, and to establish their own significance that we may make a name for ourselves, they said. Of course, neither goal was achieved. Instead, they were scattered by the decisive judgment of God. And the name they made for them, they made a name for themselves, but the name they made for themselves was anything but glorious. It's now become the proverbial symbol of failure. And instead of making the gate of God, which is the original meaning of the word Babel, instead of making the gate of God, what they built was the classic, the quintessential house of confusion. That's always where sin leads. So God comes. He disrupts this unified revolutionary spirit by diversifying the language, which is not in itself a curse so much as it is 
Again, a divinely instituted means for controlling the revolutionary heart of humanity. This desire that we have to control our destiny apart from God. And after this in Scripture, on through the storyline now, Babel and Babylon, that, that name becomes in Scripture the symbol of self-reliant, imperialistic, secularism becomes the symbol of control without accountability to the creator. Whether it's Isaiah talking about Assyria and Babylon, John speaking about the Roman Empire, in the end, every kingdom that sets itself up to do battle with God, to dethrone God, and take God's place will fail at last. So what now? I mean, picture here again, it's pretty dark. In Adam, we all die. And we inherit both guilt and corruption. That's the doctrine of original sin. The curse in Eden takes immediate effect. Adam and Eve are driven from the presence of God. Paradise is lost. The refrain of Genesis 5, and he died, and he died, and he died, just confirms the triumph of the curse that sin brought in Genesis 3. You see, the flood is sent. Why? Because the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And though the flood offered an opportunity for new beginning, what happened after the flood? Well, the very first reported incident after the flood is Noah's drunkenness. Of all things, this new lapses attesting to the continuing power of sin in the race. And then the whole opening section of Genesis up through chapter 11 ends with this dreadful account of the Tower of Babel, which was just a massive monument to fallen humanity's insolence and arrogance and excessive pride and rebellion against God. These first 11 chapters of Genesis make clear from Cain and Lamech all the way to the, the, the builders of Babel make clear that pride and violence, greed and fear, lust and envy. These things are endemic in a world that has rebelled against God and sought its own way apart from Him. And if anything's certain, it's that our own resources cannot deal with the reality and ruin of our human sinful. If there's an answer, if there's a solution, it must come from beyond human history into human history. And the seed of promise and hope that we find in Genesis 3.15 is that God will do this. He will intervene at last and do the new, decisive, miraculous thing that's needed. Now, see, now we're in a place to grasp the significance that God's call to Abraham is the next thing in the storyline. Right on the heels of this whole depressing narrative of regression and revolution of human sin and rebellion in chapters 3 through 11, from the start, See, Abraham is called to distance himself from Babylon, from the city of human arrogance and wickedness, to begin a journey in the wilderness alone with God. The end of God's redemptive history will not be Babel. It will not be Ur of the Chaldees. It will not be London. It will not be New York. It will not be Brussels. It will not be Beijing. But instead, it'll be the city of Revelation 21. 
and 22. The kingdom filled with the glory and the presence of God. God's people in God's place under God's rule for their good and for his glory. It's this vision that sustains Abraham. For the writer to the Hebrews tells us he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And that vision should sustain us as well. Okay, next week, 39 chapter. Pray for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to think through the revelation of your truth in the word. Open it to us. Make it live to us that we might be transformed by it and be your people under your rule in this place for our good and your glory. We ask it in Jesus' strong name. Amen.